Well, uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. I'm Father Bob Dowd, and uh, I teach political science at Notre Dame, and I'm also director of the Ford Family Program in Human Development Studies and Solidarity. And on behalf of the University of Notre Dame, I want to welcome you all to tonight's discussion on international human development and United States foreign policy. And the Kellogg Institute at Notre Dame, together with the Ford Family Program and the Initiative for Global Development, Catholic Relief Services, and the Notre Dame Club of Chicago is co-sponsoring tonight's event. Um, and it's a real honor for us to be, to be working together on tonight's event on such an important topic to us all. Tonight's event is really at the heart of the mission of Notre Dame. It's certainly at the heart of the mission of the Ford Program, a mission that's dedicated to developing a deeper understanding of human development and of the conditions that allow for human flourishing, as well as our roles and responsibilities. Founded in 2008, the Ford Family Program represents a new and ambitious effort to one, listen to people challenged by extreme poverty, to listen to them, to work together with them as they realize goals that they've set for themselves, and to learn along the way how human development really takes place. In short, we seek to integrate student learning, research that addresses real-world needs, and grassroots community engagement that builds capacity. We've only just begun, and uh, we're off to a great start. We seek to partner with local communities. We're partnering with local communities in East Africa, in Uganda, and in Kenya. We're partnering with universities in those countries. And, of course, we're partnering with Catholic Relief Services, and we're really honored to be doing that. These are very, very exciting days at Notre Dame. Notre Dame is turning outward in new ways, out into the world, in partnership with people who are challenged by extreme poverty and other types of challenges as well. And one of the most exciting efforts is the Initiative for Global Development at Notre Dame. And right now, I'd like to invite Dr. Robert Bernhard. Bob Bernhard is the Vice President for Research at Notre Dame, just to say a few words about the Initiative for Global Development. Bob? Thank you very much, Father Bob. Uh, I'd like to say first, uh, my wife Debbie and I had the uh, privilege this last summer to tour Uganda and Kenya and some of the operations that the Ford Family Program puts on there. Uh, it was a very memorable summer, and I have to say that um, the video means a whole lot, the Ford Family video means a whole lot more to me now uh, with uh, recognizing the people that, I, that we met there and seeing some of the various programs that are ongoing. So thank you for that, Father Bob. Um, first of all, on behalf of the university, I want to thank the Ford Family Program at Kellogg Institute for putting on this event. Uh, since the time that Father Bob raised the idea of this event, I've been looking forward to tonight. Uh, we've got great speakers, and uh, on behalf of the university, I want to uh, thank also uh, Professor Collier and Sean Callahan for being with us this evening and coming to help us uh, put on this program, uh, which I think we're all going to enjoy. And uh, the fact that we had a chance to interact with them will be a tremendous uh, opportunity tonight to to uh, learn more about development. To speak a little bit about the in Initiative for Global Development, uh, as many of you probably know, Father John Jenkins has made advancing our research programs at the university one of his um, major themes of his administration. I'm very fortunate to have joined the university five years ago uh, to sort of shepherd those efforts in research uh, advancement. Uh, we've done some uh, looking around the university to find out what our major initiatives ought to be, what our focus should be. Uh, we've asked the faculty, we've asked our friends, uh, we've asked people, uh, in fact, policymakers in Washington, uh, lots of different sources to find out what it is that people think that uh, is at the center of Notre Dame's mission, research mission. One of the very exciting ideas, most exciting ideas that came forward was the idea of initiative for global development. 
the recognition is that the university has, has had for many years many assets in global development areas. Uh, they grew up uh, under the initiative of great leadership. Uh, they do great work uh, for us uh, in both service, uh, research, and as well as education. Uh, but the idea was that we could probably do more. We could, we could aspire to higher things uh, by connecting those assets together and providing some resources that alone they couldn't do. So that's the idea of the initiative global development. Uh, we intend now to start linking our global development uh, assets together. Uh, the video shows you uh, the areas, showed you the areas where we are uh, active now, and the things that we try to, we'll try to do. Uh, what the initiative will do is uh, hopefully make us more applied more translational in our work, uh, help to take some of the service opportunities that the university offers and connect them to research opportunities so that the lessons learned from those can be published and so that other, others can use them. So the whole idea has been to form this initiative in a way that doesn't compete with any of the initiatives we have, but in fact binds them together, uh, that we create the infrastructure needed uh, to uh, make those um, initiatives a bit more practical, make them um, where needed, uh, couple into research, basic research better, uh, to help us to, uh, in, in, in the end, uh, be a force for good in the world in the area of human development and global development. So that's our initiative. I hope you enjoy this evening, and I look forward to the program myself. So thank you, Father Bob. Thanks, Bob. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to introduce Paolo Carozza. Paolo is director of the Kellogg Institute for International S Studies, and uh, he's also, by the way, director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights at Notre Dame. Um, Paolo is a lawyer, as you might suspect. Paolo is approaching slowly here, along with our speakers. Um, Paolo is author of many, many insightful works, and he has served as president of the Inter-American uh, Commission on Human Rights. He also founded Notre Dame's program on law and human development. So Paulo brings tremendous experience, dedication, and creative energy to the Kellogg Institute. And uh, I now just present to you Paulo Carozza, who will moderate our discussion tonight. So please join me in welcoming Paulo and our speakers to the stage. Thank you very much, Father Bob. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, it's a real privilege to be on this stage with two such distinguished guests and even more to be speaking about something that is so central to the mission of Notre Dame, central to the mission of the Notre Dame as a great research university and as a great Catholic university, indeed as the greatest Catholic research university in the entire world. This is quite central to that whole endeavor that we are a piece of. And so uh, to have a renowned international development economist like Paul Collier, a distinguished and a deeply experienced practitioner of human development with Catholic Relief Services like Sean Callahan with us tonight uh, is, is a wonderful way to help us understand better our own mission, our own role in the world, and what is called of us as, as a university. I promise this will not be an evening entirely taken up with introductions, <laughs> which is what you've had so far. But uh, given, I guess, at least a, a few words of further introduction before I give them the floor are in order. Uh, Paul Collier, uh, a professor at, at, and the director of the Center for the Study of African Economies, is a professor of economics and public policy at Oxford University at the uh, Blavatnik School of Government. Um, his work, wide-ranging, uh, covers the causes of civil war, effects of humanitarian aid uh, and development aid, the problems of democracy in low-income countries. Uh, and among the many books that he's written, perhaps the one that is best known to many of us, which has been the subject of so much uh, uh, study, learning among our students, and inspiration to work in human development um, is the book The Bottom Billion. But among other ones are Wars, gun and Guns and Votes, and more recently a book called The Plundered Planet, 
how to reconcile prosperity with nature. He's very much a public intellectual as much as a scholar writing in newspapers uh, and in other fora and a practitioner, He's currently advisor to the strategy and policy development uh, arm of the International Monetary Fund and other bodies. Uh, Professor Paul Collier. Thanks very much. To, to avoid interrupting our discussion with yet one more in introduction later on, uh, let me introduce also now before we begin, uh, Sean Callahan, who uh, is not, or at least uh, no longer, as you've been told, the Executive Vice President for Overseas Operations of Catholic Relief Services. Uh, Mr. Callahan has recently assumed a new and even more significant role at Catholic Relief Services as the Chief Operating Officer of CRS, overseeing all the overseas operations, as well as U.S. operations, human resources, uh, and in particular, ensuring the fidelity of CRS's mission to cherish and preserve and uphold the sacredness and dignity of all human life, to foster charity, and justice, to embody Catholic social and moral teaching, as well as to enhance the performance of CRS, to stimulate its innovation and to position the agency for the future. We're very proud in Notre Dame of our rich ties to CRS and our collaborative relationship. And so it's a privilege and an honor to have Sean Callahan here as well. Please welcome. We've encouraged our guests to keep the opening remarks uh, relatively short, uh, 10 minutes apiece perhaps, uh, so that there's plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So I'll give the floor first to Professor Collier, please. Thanks very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as a non-American, let me start by saying, if, we, if you'd asked me this question sort of four or five years ago, I'd have said, well, actually, the rest of the world is kind of a, a little bit overdosed with American leadership. Um, but um, let me now reassure you that sort of having looked at the alternatives, um, uh, I think a lot of the rest of the world has concluded um, we're not ready for you to hunker down in isolationism <laughs> anytime soon, right? Uh, you've still got a job to do out there. Um, so what is the particular strength of, a, of America in sort of international influence in, in human development. And I think, it, I'm going to argue, it's when you've got your, an alignment between um, the values expressed by ordinary people in your society and what your government actually does out there in the world. And that when you can get those two things aligned, um, you really are um, unbeatable. Um, and, uh, and often you do get them aligned and sometimes you don't. Um, and let, let me just take a, a couple of examples, really important issues. I suppose the, the single biggest struggle of the last 20 years in the developing world, certainly in Africa where I work, is, uh, has been the, the struggle for democratization. You go, 20, 25 years ago, Africa was just mired in dictatorship. Um, and, and now it's much more democratic. Uh, and America's played an important part in that struggle, not just in Africa, but globally, both at the level of its values, of its ordinary citizens, and at the, the level of its foreign policy actions. So, if we start with the, the, the level of just the values of ordinary citizens and how they're transmitted, um, there's some really interesting new, new very serious economic research which has is, which is studied this and it, they've studied it by way of the, of the transmission of ideas um, as a result of students coming from other countries and studying in your society. So there's a, there's a, a global data set um, run, built by UNESCO for the last 50 years and more showing all the movements of students around the world. So if students go from Kenya to America 
in a year, that's recorded. If they go from France to Britain, that's recorded. If they go from Algeria to Russia, that's recorded. And so it's 50 years of global data, and an economist thought to check, well, has that had any influence on the pace at which countries have been able to democratize? Does it help if a lot of your students, if you start off in an autocratic society, but if a lot of your students study abroad in democratic societies and then come home, does that help? Um, and the, the, the research shows that it, it very definitely helps. So that, that whole process of teaching foreign students um, has, has accelerated democratization. Now, of course, what the students were taught was not democracy. You know, they came to study engineering or Spanish or whatever, you know. Um, but what they picked up whilst they were studying those technical things, what they picked up was what the society around them was doing. It was, it was living democratic values. And that's what people took home with them. And the research is quite fine-grained, so it can show that um, it matters where you went. Those Algerians who went to Russia and then went back to Algeria didn't do one bit of good in the passage to democracy. But those Kenyans who came here and then went back, that really did good. Right? So just at the level of both universities, what your universities have been doing, and what your ordinary people have been living the values of democracy, that's really mattered. But it's helped to align that with your foreign policy. And um, I'm going to give the, um, the example of the the response to the recent Arab Spring, um, where I think you've largely got your foreign policy right. Not, I'm going to suggest not entirely. Um, the, <coughs> if you remember, the, the first really important influence was on what happened in Egypt. There was President Mubarak, President for Life, um, and uh, and he looked, basically, to America to try and shore him up as an autocratic rule. And uh, American foreign policy, very heroically and very correctly, said to him, no, we're not going to shore you up. Your people are speaking. You know, first, um, you, you, you don't resort to violence against your people. And secondly, you know, frankly, you're no longer welcome. Um, and that was very influential, I think, in, in persuading Mubarak to step down peacefully. And then you've continued with good foreign policy with Egypt. Egypt elected the new government. It wasn't necessarily to America's taste, but very properly American foreign policy said, people have voted, people have chosen, that's the government. We'll work with you. So in, in Egypt, I think you got your foreign policy absolutely right, and it was very influential, and it meshed very much with the values that you've been living. Um, and then if we move from Egypt to, uh, to Libya, um, again, you got, you got policy, I think, really pretty right, pretty impressive. That if you remember the sequence, the, um, the Europeans were very keen to, to intervene to rescue um, what would otherwise have been Gaddafi's murderous attacks on his population. Um, but having, uh, the Europeans having said, this is what we've got to do, rescue them, the Europeans didn't actually have the military wherewithal to do it. Um, and so it was up to America to perform that rescue operation, and it did. Um, and I think that's been a triumph um, where I think you, there's still a lot of unfinished business uh, is Syria. Um, and uh, clearly, the, uh, the interventions to protect people in Libya created reasonable expectations for people in Syria 
that if they rose up against this dictatorship, they would get some sort of protection. And, uh, and America so far hasn't done that. <coughs> They've had to actually look to, <coughs> to Turkey to try and provide safe havens, but it's a very limited sort of safe haven. So I think there's still unfinished business in American foreign policy in Syria. Um, one of the lessons of foreign policy is consistency really matters. And so having adopted a pattern first in Egypt and then in Libya, I think it's important to continue it in Syria. So much for the transmission of democratic values where I think in recent years, America's scored pretty high. Let me turn to, to one other um, value. And again, this is a, where we need an alignment between um, the values of ordinary people and the, the chosen policies of government. And, that, and that's the duty of rescue. Um, and that became most apparent uh, in the aftermath of the Haitian earthquake. Um, this disaster which killed so many people and which required uh, a substantial and swift response. And, uh, and this was, frankly, America at its best. Um, at the level of ordinary individuals, um, we get the truly astonishing figure that, as far as we could see, over half of all Americans actually contributed to that earthquake relief, over half. Quite extraordinary, spontaneous, individual gestures of, of empathy, of compassion, of concern. Um, and then your government uh, did exactly the same. Um, I, was, I happened to be in Washington at the time of the earthquake, and because I'd been working on Haiti, Haiti the, the State Department called me in. And, uh, and I, I was really impressed by, by what America did. Um, and it contrasted with, um, with Europe, I'm afraid. So what America did was recognize that the buck stopped with America um, and that response had to be swift. And that's what America did. America, you know, you sent in the Navy, you sent in big forces, and you sent in very high level political involvement, both with your government and then with President Clinton, who uh, has a long involvement and was instrumental in trying to rebuild governance in Haiti after the earthquake. And that unfortunately does contrast with what Europe got up to. Um, I was also involved, obviously as a European, with what Europe was up to. And I have to tell you what Europe was up to was, um, was complaining that America was not consulting Europe enough <laughs> um, and that Europe had to get itself branded in this space. Um, so Europe was busily fussing about turf and, turf and recognition whilst America was actually sending in um, the military to go and try and rescue people from the rubble. Um, so I've given you two examples where America is at its best, you're still very much needed, but you're at your best where you align the values of ordinary people with the actions of your government. Perhaps in discussion, I might come out with cases where things are not quite so well aligned. Um, in fact, just before I hand over, let me go to one where I'll carry on with this duty of rescue, but suggest why sometimes things are not so well aligned. Um, and that is, we've discussed the policy response to Haiti where policy was excellent. <coughs> but the other area is policy towards um, aid. And uh, American government's rightly concerned about um, food, especially in the wake of the, the recent price spike, well, global price spike in food. There's an important role for, for relief there. Um, but lo and behold, what's actually happening to USAID uh, is very severe budget cuts. And we all know why 
budgets are being cut, you're, you're in a fiscal crisis, and so you're looking for money to save. But frankly, the aid budget um, is so tiny relative to overall spending um, that it makes not one whit of difference to your fiscal deficit whether you reduce aid or increase it. It just doesn't matter. Um, uh, and so these savage cuts um, don't actually address your fiscal deficit, but what they do is inadvertently um, signal uh, a set of values which are not aligned with America's true values. Um, it's very important at times of austerity to transmit the right signals. And uh, as, as a as a Briton, I have to say I'm rather proud of what our own government has done here, that it's actually not just protected the aid, but it's, it's the only part of the budget which has been protected, because Britain's fiscal mess um, is every bit as big as America's. In fact, it's a whole lot worse. So every part of the budget is being slashed except for aid, which is actually being increased. Now, at times of austerity, um, Actions like that create a very powerful signal. You know, at times of profligacy, it's easy to be generous. You actually can't distinguish generosity from stupidity. Right? But at times of austerity, you really can tell the sheep from the goats. And so the world out there is actually noticing that. You know, it's noticing that America's prioritized aid is pretty low, and that Britain's prioritized aid is pretty high. Um, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, has just appointed David Cameron, Britain's Prime Minister, as the co-chair of thinking about um, the goals of development going forward from 2015. So why did Ban Ki-moon turn to, to David Cameron and not President Obama? Because in a way, each society has inadvertently signaled a set of values, and I guess the Secretary General of the UN has judged that Britain's values are actually more aligned with, 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 the, with the concern for, for the world's poor at the moment. So, um, that's a case where the, the Haitian earthquake revealed what America's values are in terms of ordinary citizens. We know you're a highly compassionate and concerned society. So why mess up with this inadvertent, but actually quite powerful signal of a lack of generosity um, in order to save yourselves a few dollars when you're facing a deficit which really is so big relative to this little decision that it it's the wrong decision to have taken. Anyway, let me pass on. Thank you, Paul, very much. Sean? I'd like to ask you two different questions and then maybe share two stories. And that is, what is international human development? What does that mean and how do we define it? And actually, who defines it? And then what is American leadership? Or maybe more appropriately, who demonstrates American leadership? I, I was in the town of Dadaab and uh, sitting in, in a refugee camp with a young woman named Fareha Mohammed. And Dadaab was a town of about 30,000 that had now swelled to about 450,000 people. And so the local residents were a little intimidated by the massive number of refugees that were there. It turned out that as we sat with Fareja in her little hut that she had made out of sticks and told us uh, very proudly how she had woven the sticks together and put plastic over it so she could shelter her family. And not only did she do that, but she invited another family to live with her. And so here was a woman who had nothing who started reaching out to others. And as we talked about her story with her and said, how did you come here? 
She had walked from Mogadishu for two months and 28 days with an infant son and pregnant. Her husband had just been killed. So she came out of a situation of violence. She traveled long roads where other women in the group were violated along the way. She was spared because of the pregnancy. Wild animals were attacking the group and they'd throw rocks to get away from them. But she came to the site of safety and people were there to give her some assistance and she took advantage of that and then reached out to others. When we were sitting there talking to her and I, I asked her, you've come through so much, so much turmoil, you've lost your husband, long pregnancy, long walk, threatening things. What do you need now? And she said, as tears were streaming down her face, she said, well, you know, I have to wash my kids' clothes at night because we only have one set. And so I dry them overnight and then we dress them again. And then, she, then I said, well, what can we do for you? How can we assist you? And she said, what I really worry about is the cold at night and tomorrow for my children. And so as we look at what is international human development, is it protecting people from that cold at night? And is it helping them deal with tomorrow for their children? We can always look at the numbers of increased education and increased economic development, but if we're not providing that access and opportunity to these individuals, are we really having that impact that we should? When I think about American leadership, we had a great example of that, I think, uh, and many of you probably participated in it uh, over the last couple of years. And that was in Sudan, uh, what is now uh, Sudan and South Sudan. And about three years ago, we had a gathering in, in Sudan and met with the bishops and with the church people and started talking about what if we knew that Rwanda was going to happen and we had two years notice, what would you do? And we basically said, geez, this is a big problem. Governments aren't really watching it. Nobody's engaged. What can we do? And we said, we have to do something. So we did our scenario planning and did four different scenarios and we tried to decide what we would do. We talked with the bishops and tried to see what they thought they could do and here was a persecuted minority in, in what is now Sudan and in South Sudan they had been devastated by decades of war. And so we started designing some plans on how we would move, move things forward and who would participate and one of the first things we did was invite the bishops to come to Europe to come to the United States. And they came, and they met with people, and they were hesitant. They might have been a little scared. They didn't know what it would mean for them or their people. And so they came through that first visit, and met some people at the UN, and then they went back. And we designed other programs, and praying for peace, and some other things that were gonna occur. And then we said, it's not good enough. We're not getting the traction. The leadership isn't there. So we talked to the bishops again, and we invited them back again. And one of our colleagues said, the bishops have to know the power that they have. They have to realize their voice, and they have to speak for their people. And as he talked to the bishops, they came over the second time. And they were heartened that the first time, many people got behind them. But the second time, wow, there was a groundswell of people. People appreciated the situation that was going on in Sudan, and they said, we can help, we can fight back. And so the bishops started to gain their own strength and power, and they started to speak. They came to many universities, they came to Notre Dame, and they visited around the country, and they ended up with the National Security Council at the White House for what, according to the National Security team, said was a seminal visit. 
And that was because they were empowered. And that type of leadership helped the United States government to make the right decision. But who led the charge? Was it the students on the basketball court? Was it the bishops? Was it the campaign that we had? Was it the fact that people took Sudanese in the United States down to the embassy in Washington, D.C. and helped them vote? American leadership is looking for leadership among the American people. And it's the obligation of each of us and the obligation of the University of Notre Dame to provide that leadership. Experts don't have all the answers. And sometimes you not only have to lead with your heart, with your head, but also lead with your heart. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the privilege of sitting in the middle chair, of course, is that now I can monopolize the conversation myself. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's so much to ask and to comment on, even in these short presentations that's so rich. It's striking to me that uh, from the world of scholarship, deeply informed by an engagement with policy, but a world of practice as well, that both of you have presented a vision of human development to us and the practice and importance of human development in international affairs and particularly in the United States that is so explicitly and comprehensively values-oriented, values-based, driven by values, disseminating values. Now, of course, as someone at Notre Dame, I think that's perfect, right? That's exactly what we're about as a university. That's what we love. That's what we try to inculcate in our students. And I think it's important. But one of the things that's maybe even more striking to me is what you didn't say in saying that. Because in the discussions that one hears about human development and U.S. foreign policy, probably the dominant theme is, well, this is something we need to do because it's in our self-interest. Uh, we need to do it because that's what's necessary in order to achieve security. Uh, the links between the security of the United States in foreign policy and the development of the world are the rage. Now, I don't mean to put that in doubt. I, I think we can all see that in a certain sense that's it's a self-evident connection, right? But I'm curious as to why you would choose, even in just 10 minutes of remarks, to focus your remarks not at all on the <laughs> self-interested, security-based aspects of human development, but on the values-based aspect of human development. What, what does that say about uh, your, your approach, what the approach of the United States ought to be? Why emphasize that? And lastly, <coughs> before I open it up to others as well, that approach that emphasizes the importance of inculcating values, disseminating values, having development projects that are driven by fundamental values rather than a self-interested security-based approach, what does that imply or say about what Notre Dame should be doing in this field, what Notre Dame can do? What is our responsibility as an educational institution given the approach that you take? Yeah, well, I mean, to answer the last first, it's obviously um, a values-based approach is, is kind of, if not uniquely well-suited to, to Notre Dame, it's particularly suited to Notre Dame. Um, you're a values-based university, and most universities are not. Um, so, um, so it's particularly suited <coughs> suited for you. Um, why did I not start with this sort of security and self-interest dimension? <coughs> I think it's there. I think it's been, um, frankly, sort of overplayed the last decade. <coughs> um, uh, and um, and, it, and it's also... Um, I think demeaning to, to ordinary Americans to think that everything has to be dressed up in self-interest. Um, 
ordinary Americans didn't reach into their pockets and send money to Haiti because they worked out that it was in their security interest. Haiti is not really a threat to America. Um, you reached into your pockets because of common human compassion. And, um, I mean, goodness, I'm an economist, and so my own field is absolutely suffused with the idea of rational self-interest. But actually, even in economics, we're kind of moving beyond that now. Um, there's a whole field of experimental economics, experimental games, where um, what researchers have very rigorously demonstrated that if you start from the premises of rational, self-interested, selfish behavior, then the behavior that people display in experimental games is completely inexplicable. Yeah. So people are not just selfish, maximizing automata. They care about others. They've got hardwired into our brains this sense of fairness and compassion. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, we, we neglect, the, the, by, by pretending that those things are not part of what we are, of, of our core identity, we demean ourselves. And so dressing everything up in some contrived argument about self-interest is, is demeaning and, and not necessary. People are just not like that. Now, having said that, I think there is a reasonable case that can be made for saying that, you know, one thing we've learned over the last 10 years is that fragile states, when they fall apart, are really incredibly costly. Um, and so it's a good idea for everybody on Earth to try and avoid that. Um, uh, and uh, one just inadvertently happened um, just in the last few months, which is Mali. Um, half of Mali is now um, a no-go area under the control of al-Qaeda. Um, I mean, this is, you know, we've got a new Somali or a new Afghan in the Taliban, um, and this was generated by, as far as we can understand, about 800 guys went off with Gaddafi's military toys um, and, uh, and confronted the Malian army, which had, had no money for, for years. And so the 800 guys with the Gaddafi military toys mowed down a couple of thousand of the Malian army. And the Malian army then went to the government and said, please give us decent equipment the president hadn't got any money, so the army then did a coup against the president. So now one half of, Malala, of Mali is under the control of Al-Qaeda, and the other half is just a complete mess. Um, so you know, inadvertently, we're still stumbling into generating failed states. Um, so are we doing too much? No, we're doing too little. I think, I think Paul hit the topic that was key, and that is really motivation. And when you go out in the field, when you talk to people, and those of you who have traveled overseas, people are very intelligent. I mean, they know why you're there. They know how you're thinking, what you're doing, what your motivation is. And so I, I think if we do things for that selfishness, you will end up reaping the rewards of that selfishness. And I think during the Cold War, we have done that in many occasions. Look at the dictators that we supported in areas for our own security, and how long did it last? So I think really we need to look at and not be afraid to espouse our values, what those values are, why we have those values, and to share those values. When we went into Afghanistan, I was mentioning to some people, and people wanted to keep away from us because our name is Catholic Relief Services. And I was joking with someone, I'd meet with the four Catholics in the country at the time, um, and have mass with the Italian attache who happened to be named Father Moretti. And so the six of us could sit there and, and have mass. And 
we started seeing the email trails that said, don't go with that group because they have Catholic in the name and it's not gonna work out too well in Afghanistan because they're very conservative here. And so I went to my staff, who happened to all be Muslim, working in difficult areas of the country, and, and I said, well, why are you working for Catholic Relief Services? And are you worried about why we're here? Because people in my headquarters are now getting a little nervous on why we're here. And the comment that they gave to me was, you're people of the book, and we know why you're here. Now, why are those other people here? And so I think those motivations, people can see and they can see through. And if you take that selfish motivation, as we see in the situation of Iraq, where many people in the world thought that we invaded Iraq for oil, the turmoil and the explaining that we have to do and the, the damage to our reputation is absolutely terrible. But if they see you working out in Gore, in Chacharan, in Afghanistan, and seeing our women help them plant helping women plant potatoes or do microfinance in certain areas. They know we're there to help support them. They know we're there living our values. And then they begin to trust and realize, is that more sustainable than putting someone in power that didn't actually earn the right from civil society? What actually gives us more security? When I'm in the field, our staff and the local villagers are the security. If we went in with a different motivation, would that be there? And do those people then convert their hearts and see Americans in a different way because of the way we live, the way we act, and the way we believe? Thank you. Very clearly, one of the very powerful messages uh, in, in both the, the different perspectives is, uh, is then that working in human development for an American to be committed to our democracy, promoting human development internationally, is as much, at least, if not more, really about who we are than about yeah. who we're helping, mm -hmm. about who we aspire to be, what kind of a people, and what kind of a heart we want to have. Uh, our students, we hope very much, are absorbing that lesson through the work that they do in, in human development, and we're very proud of, of the, the work that they do the studies they have, the commitments, and the values they have. So as a way to open up now the floor to everybody else and your questions and so forth, we thought, I thought we'd begin with uh, a couple of questions precisely from our students, some of our students who have been spending their time working in human development. Uh, we're, we're glad to have them here with us. Thank you very much. Teresa, do you want to start? You can introduce yourself and say a little bit about what you did over the summer and then uh, whatever your question might be. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Teresa. I'm a senior chemical engineering major uh, undergraduate at Notre Dame right now. Um, and I spent this past summer working in Uganda in the village you saw in that second video uh, with Dan here. And we were doing a research project on their drinking water. Um, it could be described basically as behavioral research. The Ford program is interested in putting in new groundwater pumps in that village. And we were doing kind of background preliminary research to figure out what systems they have put in place right now for the way they maintain the pumps they currently have and also the ways in which they handle their water to sort of determine in what ways they might, might contaminate a new pump by current behavior. Um, so we were both living there with families in that village um, for seven or eight weeks this summer. Um, and I first wanted to thank you for your comments so far. Um, it's been very interesting to hear you speak about the different values that are underlying what makes America a leader or a good example um, for the developing world. Um, and I guess on behalf of my uh, fellow students who are also interested in development and heading out into that field, um, in what ways can um, individual Americans sort of contribute? Should we be focusing more on being the example and trying to work within our own country to exemplify the values that we have and to make our country represent that by actions? Or is it something that's better expressed by going to work directly in the field and with people in foreign countries? How can we 
best make our country into the best example that it can be and also become involved ourselves. Thank you. I, I guess doing my best Jim Lehrer impersonation, I'm supposed to now give the first answer to the other person <laughs> than before. So, Sean, why don't you start this time? Sure. It, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I guess my response to that would be is, in anything you're doing, you're being an example. You have to understand that people are watching and seeing what you're doing. And it, it reminds me, right after 9-11, I happened to be in Pakistan. And we had just come back from Afghanistan, and the U.S. had just bombed, and so we were talking to people in Pakistan. And the comment that we got from these people was great sadness on what had happened in the United States. They were saying, it's terrible what has happened. We want to give our condolences to you. And now, many people would consider these people terrorists just because they were from Pakistan. But then they asked a question. They said, but then you had to retaliate and you had to do all these things. And they said, we thought you were bigger than that. And it kind of struck us. This was something that really hurt us, 9-11, but they thought we were bigger and stronger than retaliating after that. And so I think we have to really look at how we act and then how people view our actions. And are they motivated by selfishness or personal interest, or are they motivated by the common good? And so I think that's where we have to see our values. If you go overseas, you're not off any time. 24 hours a day, people are watching you and thinking about, this is how an American acts. And if you're back in the United States and you're not saying, hey, this shouldn't be happening. Our government shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be supporting them. They're saying, is the society asleep? Are they just lazy? Do they not care about us? So I, say, I would just say, either way, you can go out in the field, but know you're being an example, and that's a tremendous responsibility. But also here, how we live our values as well, and how we represent them in our government is another way that we have to demonstrate that. Do you want to add some things well, Paul? Yeah, I mean, in, uh, what came to mind was Charles Dickens' book, Bleak House, where I'm, there's a character a woman who is always going on about Africa and she's running relief programs about Africa. Um, but actually, um, she's a very cruel woman in her personal relations with her neighbors, with her relatives. She's just a cruel woman. And what Dickens is pointing out there is that what you want to avoid is some sort of theatrical compassion with a capital C where Africa is the, the symbol of victimhood that you as the great person are going to save. Um, that's, that, that is the worst form of, of arrogance. And so, um, I, I mean, it's, it's very much what Sean was saying. How you relate to people whether they're in America or in Africa, that's the, the important thing. There, there are, unfortunately, excruciating needs right here in Chicago, and there are excruciating needs in Africa. And it's, it's your choice as to what, what of those inspires you most, and it's perfectly legitimate to be inspired by either. Um, but the inspiration should be to recognize that you know, you're a young person with, with values and skills to bring, and you can be useful to others. But it's a, but it's a, it's a personal relationship. It's not um, saving Africa. It's not that woman in Bleak House. I, I, if, I, I believe it was Chesterton who referred to people like the woman in Bleak House as those who love humanity but hate people. That's right. right. Exactly so. Yes. Exactly so. Let me take one more question from one of our students before we, we open up a little bit further. Dan, would you uh, introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Dan Courtney. Uh, I'm an undergrad at Notre Dame, uh, civil engineer. And uh, I was lucky enough to work with Teresa uh, in Uganda this summer uh, as an intern for the Ford Family Program. Um, and we were researching uh, water re uh, research in the way that Teresa described. Um, so I'd like to ask a question to both of you. First of all, uh, Mr. Collier and Mr. Callahan, thank you for, for speaking with us. 
Um, I, on sort of a more pragmatic side of kind of this implementing of, uh, you know, d development in, in developing countries. Um, so when Teresa and I were, were in the village, we noticed that what happened in a lot of villages was pumps, wa water wells would be installed by certain private NGOs, either American or uh, British otherwise. And then when they would break, along would come in another uh, you know, charity and install a second one right next to it. And we see this in, in, in several villages where um, you have these abandoned wells all over the place. Um, so f in itself, we see that as a problem because it's, in a, it's inefficient, it's a waste of resources. But I, I, I think what's, what's a little deeper underneath that is that the village, um, in villages where this was happening, they lose a sense of the responsibility of well maintenance because, you know, well, if, if it breaks, maybe the next uh, American charity will come in and install the next well. Um, but in places where we found where there's, there's one well and you, you, you have, you know, it, it works or it doesn't, uh, we see the local community, the local structure, um, you know, they f find, find ways to look, go out, look for higher mechanics and, and fix it. Anyway, that was a very specific uh, example, but I would like to ask the question, um, how can organizations, all with good intentions, um, whether they be governmental, private, charitable, um, how can they look to communicate or coordinate with each other and also with the communities that they're trying to help so as not to have all this duplication or waste and also to have kind of a holistic and sustainable approach? Yeah, okay, so um, wells in East Africa, there's a, there's a brilliant study um, of the maintenance of wells um, by a guy called Ted Miguel, and he, uh, he looked at, um, he compared a load of villages in Kenya, and then across the border, same set of villages in Tanzania. And what he, what he found was a striking difference, that in, in Kenya, um, in the villages that were ethnically diverse, people couldn't cooperate in order to maintain the well. They could only cooperate in those villages that were ethnically homogeneous. And when we're talking about well maintenance, it's really not a matter of skills, it's a matter of cooperation. There's a public good there, and people have to learn to cooperate to fix it. And if they can't cooperate, then when it breaks down, everybody just sits and waits, for another agency to come along, right? Um, so, in Kenya, in those ethnically diverse villages, people just could not cooperate across ethnic lines. And so the, the pumps failed, that was the end of it. In Tanzania, same, you know, here's a border which was completely arbitrary sometime in the late 19th century, so same pattern of ethnic mix on either side of the border. But in Tanzania, no effect. The pumps were maintained, whether the villagers were ethnically homogeneous, just one tribe, or ethnically mixed. So something had enabled people in Tanzania to surmount the problems posed by heterogeneity. They'd overcome the difference of tribe and were able to cooperate. Now, why? And the answer was that um, was leadership inculcating different values. Um, Tanzania had had a, a great president, President Nyerere, who got all his economics wrong, but that you can correct for, or you can recover from. What Nyerere got right was inculcating in Tanzanians a sense of common identity. He said, forget, forget which tribe you're from, forget the old animosities between tribes. You're all Tanzanians. We're all poor, and so we're all going to have to work together to overcome poverty. And that message just continued year after year 
and sustained by his successors, worked. In contrast, across the border in Kenya, you've got a different president, Kenyatta. Kenyatta had a better understanding of economics than your area, but a much worse understanding of values. And so Kenyatta was himself a Kikuyu, and so he favored the Kikuyu. So Nairobi, which was in the, in the heartland of the Kikuyu, grew like Topsy under his rule, whereas Kisumu, which was the Luo territory, stagnated. And then, when he stepped down, sorry, died, you got a president from a different ethnic group, the Kalenjin, come in, and his big idea was, I'm a Kalenjin. And so the Kikuyu were out, and the Kalenjin were in. So there was an airport stuck in the middle of the Kalenjin territory, and all, all resources favored them. And then when he was finally pushed out, you got back to a Kikuyu who, guess what, favored the Kikuyu. So for, for um, 50 years, Kenya's had um, reinforcements of a sense of, you're not Kenyan, you're, you're some tribe. Whereas Tanzania has had a different set of values, overcoming trip. Now, the thing finally played out in 2008, where, if you remember, Kenya came within days of open civil war. Um, but to get back to your, um, your pumps, um, you said you need a holistic approach, and that holistic approach is really about values around cooperation that without paying attention to, to building the patterns of cooperation, then, then indeed um, the pumps don't get maintained. I might just add that it, it's somewhat counterintuitive, my answer for Americans, because it, the answer is basically um, we Americans are impatient and we like to do things for people. And so are we doing it for the community and maybe sometimes for ourselves, or are we doing it with the community? And so I think that's something that you really have to look at. How are you doing it? And development is not a quick process. Development takes time. You need to motivate the community. The community has to understand and desire what they need in the community, and you need to map that out together. And you don't just come into a community and say, here's a well for you, now take it away. When I first started with CRS, I worked in Nicaragua, and right after I got there, um, the Atlantic coast of Nicaragua, Bluefields, was hit by an earth, uh, a hurricane, and it decimated the whole island, and houses were lost. And we started developing a program that was working with the local community on rebuilding their homes. And part of that rebuilding was getting families together, 10 or 15 families, and they had to decide on the design of the homes, how they were gonna build them, who was going to build them, and then they'd go into the process and no one could enter their house before everyone's house was done. And so we went for this process and in addition to that, after all this devastation, we were going to make them contribute to building their own homes. And people were criticizing us, as you might imagine, how can you make these poor people pay for their homes that rebuilding after this great loss? Well, along came the Cuban government and built these two-story houses for people. They were beautiful. And I was going, who the heck is gonna want my houses, you know, that we're helping to do at CRS because they have to work for it, you know, they're gonna pay for it, and they're gonna build their own houses. When you can go into this beautiful Cuban housing, this two stories. Well, government assigned people to the Cuban housing, and those who didn't get into the Cuban housing continued to work on ours, and they built it in a local style, not the two-story style, um, and they built it around and, and made it so they could add on to little pieces and all, and then they used the resources that they had uh, to put some areas in with some concrete so they could walk in and out of the houses without the mud, um, you know, getting up to their knees and all. When you came back to those different villages um, five years later, uh, people were hanging outside of the Cuban houses because they were falling apart. They hadn't invested, they didn't know how it was going. And the houses that they built themselves had been added onto, they had put latrines out there, they had put sidewalks, they had put community areas. We talked to the community and asked them, 
how they would like to design it, and they designed it and did it. We provided some technical assistance, we provided some resources, but we didn't do it. We worked with the community. The Cuban houses sat there and became an eyesore. So I, I think it's what we call in the development field something we call appreciative inquiry. When you go into an area, don't look like we do as Americans and see what they're doing wrong. Look and see what they're doing right and build upon that. Who is doing something right in that village and how can you improve upon it? I was in Lucknow uh, in India at one point and when you come in as an American, people come out to you and they recognize you and they think you're doing such terrific things and you're so smart. And so I had this older woman come up to us and say, wow, you guys gave a great presentation. You're so bright, you're so wonderful. And we were dealing with women who hadn't come out of the houses before and we were sitting there talking. And, uh, and I, said, I said, well, what do you do? And she said, uh, well, I'm, I'm the birth attendant here. And I said, oh, well, that's very nice. That's an incredibly important job. Oh, but I'm not as bright as you all, and I don't know the things that you know. And I said, can you tell me how many children you've delivered in the villages around here? And she said, 84. And I said, you know how many children I've delivered? <laughs> Zero. I said, who's the expert here? And she said, but you're educated. I said, you're educated. You can educate me. Maybe there's some things I can offer you, but you can offer me a lot too. And if we work together, maybe we can get there. So raising local people in the esteem in their community, whether it's traditional birth attendants, whether it's teachers or others, is the way to go as we move forward. And not for us to come in as Americans with the answers. Oftentimes we have the answer, but it may not be for that community. Thank you, wonderful things. We uh, we do have a little bit of time left. If there are uh, a couple other questions or comments from any of you, I'd be glad. I know that there's, this, there's a hand over here that's been up for quite a long time. So we're going to start there. Uh, if you'll wait just for a second, they'll bring a, a microphone around to you so we can hear better. My name is Juanita Boris. I want to suggest that um, the study that Mr. Collier referred to, the UNESCO study of foreign students who studied in America 50 years ago, that I'm one of those who came here in the Fulbright haze. But what occurs to me is that the world that then, 50 years ago, was locked in um, post-World War II. And I remember how countries were becoming independent every year. The Philippines became independent in 46, then it was India and Pakistan, then it was one after another, then decades later it was Africa becoming independent from European colonial. So we were in this world of countries wanting to be independent, and then this ideological battle between Russian and communism and Chinese communism, then we got locked into that too. And my question is, what is the role of the military now? Because then, even in Nicaragua, in Cuba, etc., the U.S. military was not even as strong as it is now. We had bases in the Philippines that went to Vietnam to fight the war. So what is the role of the military now, hand in hand with the development aid program that USID does across the world because globalization has also made us more aware of the human face. Before we didn't see what we look to one another. Mm. Now we all know what the Sudanese look like, we know what the, you know, it's like we all know one another in the world. So I think it, we are more compassionate but I'm still worried about military power, US military power. Thank, thank you very much. Um, either, either one of you would like to comment on it? Yeah, I think um, the, uh, the danger with policy towards military power is that it sort of lurches from one extreme to the other. So I think you go through a phase where um, you're kind of so averse to it that you refuse to use it at all. That's kind of 1994 in Rwanda, where 800,000 people get slaughtered because 
No one did anything. Right. You just say, oh, you know, we can't send in any troops. Um, and then you lurch from that to, um, you know, to, to Iraq. Um, uh, and now we've sort of lurched back again with, as I say, with Syria, people are being slaughtered and, and we sit there and, and do nothing. And Mali, 800 men take over half a country um, and we let it happen. So um, getting military intervention right is, is evidently hard. Um, but I think it's necessary. I think the, um, uh, I, I, personally, I don't believe that the world can sort of do without an American military presence. That there are situations where it's, where it's needed. Um, you know, Somalia is, is one case where the, the very simple level, the piracy off the coast of Somalia um, is generating enormous costs. One of, one of my colleagues has just quantified it just in terms of insurance premium for shipping, let alone anything else. You know? So, um, uh, a, a sort of pacifist response to, to international problems, I think, is just um, is, 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 is unrealistic. Um, there, are, there are situations like Mali, like Somalia, um, uh, like in, in Libya, where pretty modest levels of, of, of military intervention um, do a lot of good. The, 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 the great British example is, um, is troops sent into Sierra Leone, which um, ended a, a murderous um, rebel group with basically was, with, with no casualties um, uh, and has helped keep the peace ever since. I was just last month. I was in Liberia, and there's a you know, there's a UN force there, um, and uh, it's a stabilizing influence. So, um, so try and get it right. Um, you know, try and tell the difference between a Sierra Leone and an Iraq. Um, and it, it's it's actually once you frame it that way, it's not that difficult to realize that you know in Rwanda sending some troops in would have been a good idea, uh, a better idea than sending troops into Iraq. We've already gone over time, and I'm, I'm aware that uh, we'll have reception and so forth, but there's so many questions. I know there are hands up and so many issues that I can't resist, but say, if you'll bear with me, we'll take one more question. Up, up here in, in the front. I would actually like to follow up on that question. Um, throughout this discussion, and I've really appreciated the insight you both have to offer um, all of us, uh, there have been a couple examples that stand out to me as a little um, ironic almost. Um, when we talk about the values of America and the values that we demonstrate abroad, um, I think it's impossible to avoid the best funded elephant in the room, which is our military industrial complex. Um, and when we go in, when we give examples of widowed African women who are fleeing situations of extreme violence, I wonder where those weapons were manufactured or purchased. Um, and when we talk about something like Haiti, um, I wonder about the fact that a lot of that wonderful money that was donated um, with great intention was channeled and uh, a lot of the aid was implemented through the US military, um, which had an incredible and somewhat repressive presence throughout the relief efforts. Um, I wonder what kind of integrity we can speak to about American values when there's these competing faces, incredibly disproportionate and competing faces of the American military abroad and then our foreign aid. And I would like to introduce maybe even the term and be so bold as to call it neocolonialism, um, especially when referring to a continent like Africa. 
Sean, would you like to start? Sure. I you're, mean, you're working for an organization that you emphasize the Catholic in the name, but it's a U.S.-based organization. It's a U.S.-based organization. So, how does this figure into what you do and your what you've observed? Yeah, you know, there's a lot of challenges with the military, and you might imagine um, when we went into Afghanistan. Uh, I was working in Afghanistan, and then we had 9/11 occur, and then all of a sudden there's bombings going on in Afghanistan, and and so were we going to be part of the quote-unquote occupying force coming in as a development agency? And we had to make a decision at that time that we weren't going to accept U.S. government funding at that time. Now, given that over several years, then we did take some U.S. government funds, but for the first five years or so, we didn't take it, and frankly, we were a little bit punished for it because the U.S. government wanted us to take that. Now, that being said, the U.S. military is not a monolith, and, and I think, as, as Paul said, the case of Sierra Leone, to me, is a case where intervention was definitely needed. When they're chopping off the hands of two-year-old kids um, and their mothers, somebody's got to stop it. And who is that one to stop it, and how is the military? We also have our military doing a lot of good things. And believe it or not, our military off Haiti coast had a super hospital there that was treating people that were affected by the earthquake. When I was working in Central America, they used to come in and treat people in Golfito, in Costa Rica, in the isolated areas of Panama to give them assistance. In Ethiopia, they were drilling some wells. We as an organization actually don't work directly with the military. We want to keep that distance, and it would only be in some emergency situations where they put a bridge in so we can get to people for assistance or to send people out to a ship if they're doing it. But, but I think we need to see where we use that military might appropriately and where we don't. And, and I don't think there's one case. I think, as Paul said, sometimes we've done it well and sometimes we've done it very poorly. I will say that the military themselves, and if you study with people who come from the military in your undergrad or graduate, they're very hesitant to intervene because they're the ones that go, they're the ones that end up getting killed, and they're the ones who get blamed for what's left over after. Uh, and I think, uh, as we saw, Secretary Gates was one of the biggest promoters for development assistance in the administration earlier. So I wouldn't just throw out the military completely. I think there are times when you need them, but it's, it's an, an, an uneven case. I'll suspend our conversation very briefly there, but only to say that... Um, as, uh, as someone from a university and from the University of Notre Dame in particular, I'm, I'm glad in a certain sense that we leave you with many unanswered questions still. Um, that's what the university is about, is to continue to push those questions, to ask them, to explore them in our research and our teaching uh, with our students, um, and starting immediately over some very fine food and drinks in the back of the room. Um, so please first uh, thank our guests for me and then... Very, a very, very special thanks to Sean and Paul for being with us, and a very special thanks to all of you. I'd also like to thank a few other people, uh, Doug and Kathy Ford, without whom there would be no Ford Family Program and Human Development Studies and Solidarity. I'd also like to thank Bob and Lindy Riley for their support of this event here tonight and their support of the Ford Program over the years. Um, certainly, it's been a pleasure to partner with Catholic Relief Services, the Notre Dame Club of Chicago, the Office of Public Affairs here at Notre Dame. So we're really, really grateful for, um, for all of that support and grateful for all of you, for your presence here tonight. So enjoy the reception. I don't know if, Paula, if you have anything. No, other than to say, please continue the conversation with us over food and Please drink. do. Thank you very, very much.